Hello everybody, welcome to today's lesson. I'm Teacher Lisa, your ESL video instructor. So today's class is in the book English for Everyone and we are going to cover chapters 53 and 54. So if you want to purchase the book, feel free to. I'll put the link in the description, but I will share screen. Let's go. Okay, here we are. Chapter 53, Old and New Situations. So let's read the introductory paragraph here. New situations may seem unusual, but over time they become familiar. You can use phrases that contain be used to and get used to to talk about this. So those are the two phrases we're going to get practice with today. So our new language, be used to and get used to, moving and living abroad, talking about old and new situations. So let's look at our key language and our first example. So let's first look at the example sentence here. So I'll read it. Waking up early for my new job was difficult at first, but eventually I got used to it. So what is the significance of this phrase? Let's look at the side note here. To get used to or to get used to doing something means that you adapt to new or different circumstances so that they become familiar. So over time, when we do something long enough, we adapt or it becomes familiar. So that's when we use that phrase, get used to. So let's look at the next example. Let's look at the sidebar first. The note says, to be used to doing something or to be used to means that you have done it long enough that it's normal and familiar. So the next example, I've lived in the city for years, so I am used to the bad pollution. So in the first example, we're adapting, waking up early, I got used to it, or we can use the synonym, right, I adapted. In the second example, I'm used to the bad pollution. We've just been exposed to it long enough. It's become familiar. So I'm used to. Let's continue. We have our tip bar, and I'm going to read it here, or our tip circle. Do not confuse these phrases with used to without the verb to be or get, which is used when talking about a regular past action. So you might have already asked yourself, what about the phrase used to? So for example, if I said, I used to go skiing in the mountains. I used to go skiing in the mountains. I'm not using the verb to be, there's no, no am or is or are. And I don't have get in front of the word used to. So again, the example sentence, I used to go skiing in the mountains. So what does that mean? That means in the past, I did something regularly. It became a regular habit or regular past action. So that's not what we're talking about in this lesson. That's different. When we use the word get in front of used to, or the verb to be in front of used to, what does it mean? It means we've adapted to something or we've done it long enough, it's become familiar. Okay, so let's look at more examples so you can continue to get the idea. First one, when I travel, I get used to different customs very quickly. Well, what does that mean? What's the translation? I find it easy to adapt to different customs when I travel. So you can say that sentence both ways. I get used to different customs or I find it easy to adapt. It's saying the same thing. Second example, I got used to cold weather within a couple of weeks. I adapted to the cold weather within two weeks. So that's sort of the translation, the English translation of the English sentence. You can say it both ways. Next example, I am used to spicy food as I've always eaten it. Or I'm accustomed to eating spicy food. So accustomed to, it's familiar now, you've done it long enough, or adapted. 
you just adapted to something. And the last one, we were used to the old teacher, but it was a shame when she left. We were accustomed to our previous teacher, but then she left. So we have the verb to be. In this case, we're in the past tense, which is were. So was or were, is or are or am is the verb to be. So when we have that in front of used to, or if we have got or get in front of used to, what does it mean? We've adapted, we're accustomed to something, or we've done it long enough, it's become normal, it's become familiar. Okay, we're going to move on and do an exercise now. Remember, you can practice with me by pausing the video before I reveal the answer. So if you have your pen and paper, go ahead and see if you understand this idea. You have to cross out the incorrect word in each sentence. So let's look at the first example. When I visit the UK, it takes me a while to get used to driving on the left side of the road. And so you had to adapt. Let's look at one through eight. So what I'll do is just read it with the correct answer uh, and you can pause the video and then you can come back and see if you got them all correct. Okay, so number one. My parents are used to living in an old building, but the creaking floorboards scare me. Number two. They were used to eating with chopsticks, but it was new to me. I found it hard. Okay, number three. Again, check your answers. My friend said I'd get used to eating my dinner late at night after a few weeks. Number four, it took a while, but now I am used to recycling all my paper and plastic each week. Number five, his friends found it strange, but he was used to doing things without using the computer. Number six, it was difficult at first, but I got used to the new routine after a few months. And number seven, we were used to the old system at work, but then it changed completely. And number eight, eventually I got used to answering the phone in English. It always feels natural now. It almost feels natural now, excuse me. Uh, hopefully all of us will be able to say that. The speaking in English, conversing, being on the telephone, writing emails in English will become natural. You'll get used to it. So again, when do we use get used to? When we do something long enough, it becomes normal or familiar. And when do we use I am used to? When we have to adapt with the verb to be and used to when we have to, we just adapt it. Okay, we're going to continue on. We're not going to do all the exercises in this unit. Okay. We just want to do a quick review of used to. Uh, that was with the example I gave you earlier. I used to ski in the mountains. I used to go skiing in the mountains. And so I'm going to read the side note. You can use used to without the verb to be or get with an infinitive to talk about past habits. You can also use it to talk about fixed states in the past but only in an undetermined time frame. So we're not talking about a specific time frame. We're just talking about in the past. So the example sentence, we used to play tennis every day, but now we prefer golf. Right? So we're not giving you an exact time frame. All we are doing is referring to the past. We're not giving specific years or dates. We're just saying in the past, this was a habit. Next one. Again, just refers to a past state, okay, not a past action. Right? We used to live in London before we moved to Sydney. So this was just a fact. It's a state. It's not an action. It's just uh, letting you know this was the state or the situation in the past. Okay. All right. We're going to move forward. We're actually going to go to our listening now. So let's play the listening. And then we're going to come back and see if you can answer these questions. 
the situation is that an international news journalist, Julia Holmes, was asked to describe her greatest cultural shocks. So we're going to listen to this journalist uh, talk about her cultural shocks. So let's play the audio for you, and then we'll see how well you listened. We'll come back and answer these questions. So let's play the audio. Here we go. I used to be surprised at the personal nature of the questions complete strangers would ask me. But I've lived in so many places now that I'm not surprised anymore if someone asks me, for example, how much do you earn? Or when do you plan to have children? I remember being pleasantly surprised in Spain when I discovered that lunches with family and friends can actually take several hours. I remember the first time I went for lunch with a friend and her family. I expected it to last about two hours. Instead, it lasted eight hours. I missed the last train back to my town and ended up staying the night. But the most extreme culture shock I have ever had was simply dealing with the amount of traffic in Hanoi in Vietnam. I stood waiting for ages by the side of the road, waiting for a safe moment to cross. In the end, an old lady grabbed my arm and just stepped out into the road with me. All the traffic moved to avoid us, but I was terrified. The funny thing was that after we crossed the road, I thanked the old lady and she just turned around and crossed the road back to the other side again. Okay, so hopefully you listened well. So in the first example, how does Julia feel now when people ask her personal questions? She's no longer surprised by it. So let's look at the first question. What examples of personal information has Julia been asked for? What is the answer? It's her salary and when she will have children. Number two, what was a pleasant culture shock for Julie when she was in Spain? Lunches lasting a long time. Number three, what happened when Julie missed her train? She stayed overnight with a friend. And number four, what happened in a busy road in Hanoi? Answer, an old lady helped Julie cross the road. So did you get 100%? If you got only one right, you need to keep practicing your listening. If you got them all right, great. If you missed one, that's okay. Uh, and out of four, I'll allow you to miss one. Your listening is, is very good. Um, but you need to be listening, listening, listening. Okay, so we're going to go to our checklist. Uh, what did we do today? We reviewed be used to and get used to. Remember when we use those? And then moving and living abroad and talking about old and new situations. So with moving and living abroad, some of the exercises had that theme intertwined in it. We didn't do all of the exercises. I do have a resource if you're looking to get a job in the US and just want to understand a little bit more about the process. I'll put the link in the description. Also, I have a video talking about American culture in the workplace. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can also watch that video that I've created and I'll link that in the description. So let's go on to chapter 54, articles. You can pause the video and come back later or keep going with me, articles. So what are they? Articles are some of the shortest and most common words in the English language. There are several rules stating which article, if any, should be used. So articles can be very annoying. <laughs> We're going to start to talk more about that, but they're also important. So new languages, articles, common, common vocab vocabulary is commonly misspelled words. And the new skill is saying words with silent letters. So these are all important. Uh, when we talk about article, it's so small, little words. For example, the, the is an article. And if you are non-native, it 
can be an issue as to when you can use it and when you need to use it. Uh, most of the time it's not an issue, but it can cause confusion if you are taking out the article when we really need it. Well, let's go right to the examples here, okay? So use a definite article, the, when the person or thing you're referring to is easily identifiable. So if you can identify it, you need to use the. The first example, we went on a tour and the guide was excellent. So it's clear who we're talking about, the guide. So there is a specific guide that we're referring to. It's clear from the sentence or the context that this means the tour guide. We know exactly who we're talking about. Next example. This includes situations where a person or thing has already been mentioned. So if I said there's a bus trip or lecture, I prefer the bus trip. So we can say the bus trip because we know what we're talking about. We already mentioned it. Is it any bus trip? No, I'm talking about a specific bus trip. Next, we use the uh, definite article before superlatives. Okay, so what is a superlative? When we say, you know, the most. So we have um, the smallest, then we have a little bit bigger, then we have the biggest. So a superlative, right? Uh, the Colosseum is probably the most famous site in Rome. So the most. So we usually use EST at the end, like smallest. And if we're not able to do that, we can say uh, like the most. Um, here, the definite article is used before superlatives such as most famous. Okay, because we can't say uh, famousest, so we say the most famous. We can't just add EST. We can say like the biggest uh, because we can just add that EST. Next, the definite article is also used with unique objects. Unique objects. I'm going to the Trevi Fountain before I check out. So this fountain is a unique object. Next, it's also used for people with unique titles. So we like to say the Pope is visiting another country this week, right? That's a unique title. Does anyone else have the title Pope in the world? No, it's just one man that has a title. So the Pope. In the U.S., we might say the president because there's only one office of the presidency in the United States and other countries too, right? The, the Pope, the president, you know, or the mayor. So with a unique title, we need that definite article, the. So these are all reasons why you need the the. Okay. Indefinite article now. So we use the indefinite articles A and N when the exact person or thing you are referring to is unknown. This is different than what we just discussed. We use the when we are sure about what we're talking about. We had those different examples. Here we use a or an, or sometimes we just say a, either one is fine, when we don't know. First example, we are trying to choose a vacation. The vacation is a new thing that is being introduced. So we have to say a vacation. We didn't even go on vacation yet. I don't know what vacation we're talking about. A vacation to the Philippines, a vacation to Thailand, a vacation to Australia. We don't know. We haven't, we haven't tried, we haven't gone on vacation. So you have to say a vacation. The next, also use the indefinite article to talk about an entire class of people or things generally. So we use a when we're being very general, we're not being specific. So India is a fascinating country to visit. India is a fascinating country to visit. So we're just talking in general. Just the country in general is very fascinating. So do you understand the difference between when we use the and a? Let me give you a pop quiz. Pop quiz time now, everyone. Let's say I have a dog and I'm going on vacation and I want you to feed my dog. So is it correct to say this? Okay. Let's say your name is Michael. I'll say, Michael, please feed the dog. I'm going on vacation. The dog food is under the counter. Or is it correct to say, Michael, I'm going on vacation. Uh, please feed a dog. The dog food is under the counter. 
Is it correct to say feed the dog or feed a dog? Feed the dog or feed a dog? Well, do you know what dog we're talking about? Yes, you know you're talking about my dog. It's clear. I'm not talking about feeding a dog, just a dog in general. So we know which dog, you have to say the dog. That's grammatically correct to say, please feed the dog. All right, let's try to do some exercises. Okay, next one. Cross out the incorrect words in each sentence. So you know the drill, or you know the, or you know the routine. Pause the video, see if you can get it correct. Okay, we have four of them, so go ahead and do that. Let's just look at the example first. Many of the largest cities in the world are in China. We learned that before superlative, the EST, like largest, biggest, we use the. So that's the reason for the the. Okay, let's do the next four. Okay, number one, I want to visit a really modern city like Tokyo. A really modern city like Tokyo. So we're just talking in general. Um, I'm not saying specifically Tokyo. I'm just saying like Tokyo. So just generally the same kind of city. So we're just going to use A. Number two, I've always wanted to go up the Empire State Building. We're being very specific. The Empire State Building. So we have to use the or the. Either way, you can say the or the. doesn't matter. Number three, uh, should we go to the restaurant we ate at on Friday? We have to use the because it's very specific. We're saying we ate there Friday, so you know which restaurant I'm talking about. So you have to use the. It's not a or an restaurant. It's, it's the restaurant. And number four, did you ride on a gondola in Venice? So we are not being specific. I don't know which specific gondola you rode on, but we are talking uh, in general. So we have to use a gondola, any gondola, a gondola. So did you get them right? I hope so. Let's continue on. The zero article, zero article. So what do we mean? Let's read the side note. You do not need an article with uncountable and plural nouns when you want to talk generally rather than specifically. This is also called the zero article. Okay, so look at that again. You do not need an article. You do not need the, you do not need a, you do not need and with uncountable and plural nouns. So if the noun is plural or it's uncountable, you can't count it, you don't use an article. Okay when you want to talk generally rather than specifically. So it's called zero article, right? No article. Here are two examples. I don't like the beach. I get sand everywhere. So sand is uncountable. So you don't need an article. We're not talking about a specific, specific sand and you can't count sand. It's uncountable, right? You don't say one sand, two sand, three sand. So no article. We're just talking in general about sand and it's uh, plural. And you can't count it. So next one, you can see famous sites all over New York City. So the number of sites, it says it's indefinite. Do we have a specific number of sites? Like do we have 100 sites, five sites? Don't know. There's so many sites and so many things that people consider sites or famous sites. So we are just talking in general and also it's plural. So we say just famous sites. So no article, no the, no a. Uh. No and. All right. Okay, so you can pause the video and see if you can do the fill in the blank. So we're going to fill in using the correct article. And then if no article is needed, just leave it blank. The first one is done for you. The Republic of Costa Rica in Central America has an estimated population of just under 5 million people and one of the highest life expectancy levels in the West. Okay, so we have an estimated. And remember, we use an when the next word starts with a vowel. So estimated, e, you can't say a estimated, you have to say an estimated. So when the next word begins with a, a vowel, you have to use an. 
Okay. And the highest, remember we said we use uh, the with superlatives, highest ends in EST. I will continue. It's incredible. It's incredible. Beauty and the diverse nature of the flora and fauna in its rainforest make. Do we need anything? Nothing. Make Costa Rica a top destination for tourists. So in this case, we don't need anything. We don't need the Costa Rica. Last lesson, we even talked about that with countries. We don't need the. It's not a Costa Rica and and. We're not talking about an indefinite article. So we don't need any article here at all. We, there's no reason or purpose to have an article. Okay, let's continue. Indeed, tourism is the country's number one source of foreign exchange. We use the. We're being very specific. We know what country we're talking about, Costa Rica. As well as famous cash crops like bananas and coffee, Costa Rica boasts 1,000 spices of orchids and a huge number, a, a huge number of bird species. Okay, let's continue. In fairly recent years, Costa Rica has tried to cut down its reliance on the income produced by the export of coffee, beans, bananas, and beef by becoming a producer, a producer of microchips. No article. Microchips, remember, plural noun. Okay. Unfortunately, the microchip market, so we're being specific, yeah, the microchip market has turned out to be an unstable, to be as unstable as that for cash crops. So hopefully, all right, we've got one more listening to do. Okay, listen to the audio and answer the questions. Here are the questions. Three people, three people, that's pretty interesting. We usually have one or two, but three people are talking about the geography of countries that they know well. So let's uh, pause the video here. I'm going to play the audio for you, and then we're going to come back to see how you did. It's just true or, or false. The first one is done for us. The ocean is on the eastern border of Chile, and it's false according to the recording. Let's, let's listen. Three people talking. Please keep track of the speakers. My parents come from Chile in South America. It's a really long country and also fairly narrow. On the western coast is the ocean, and in the north, the driest non-polar desert in the world. In this Atacama region, you can also find the tallest volcano on Earth, which is nearly 7,000 meters or more than 20,000 feet in height. What foreigners sometimes find a little weird is that even though we have desert in the north, in the south, there are mountains, glaciers, and lakes made from melted glaciers. So you can see, it's a very varied country geographically. I live in South Korea, which is the southern part of the Korean Peninsula. We have sea to the west, south, and east, and there are many islands, especially to the south and west. One of these islands, Cheju, is a famous tourist attraction because it is so beautiful and dominated by a high extinct volcano. To the east of the country, there are high mountain ranges. The weather can be really changeable. Sometimes there are typhoons that cause floods and high winds. My father is from Casablanca in Morocco. Morocco is a country in North Africa, and only a thin strip of sea separates it from Europe. Occasionally, this surprises tourists who expect North Africa to be a lot further away from Europe. The geography of Morocco is incredibly varied, with beach towns in the north and drier desert terrain in the south. Across the middle of the country are the beautiful Atlas Mountains. Okay, let's see how you did. All right, everybody, number one. Chile contains extremely dry deserts and also lakes made from glaciers. That's true. Number two, most of South Korea's islands are to the east of the country. That's false. Number three, the weather in South Korea can be quite dramatic. It's true. 
Number four, Morocco is in the south of Europe near North Africa. That's false. And Morocco is generally drier in the south than the north. That's true. So hopefully you got five out of five. This is just a good reminder that there are many people who aren't very good at geography and they might not know where your native country is on the map or on the globe, aren't sure where your country is and you might be surprised at that. So get very good at describing where your country is. Use words such as directional words, north, south, east, west, southwest, and words like, you know, I live in the city, I live in the countryside, um, I'm in an urban city, I'm in the rural uh, countryside, I'm on the coast, I'm close to the capital, I'm in the interior, I'm in the center of the country. Doing those kinds of things really does help the listener understand where you live. So get very good at describing your region, where you live, and the country. All right, so we're not going to do the crossword puzzle. It was touching on common words that are misspelled in English, but we're just going to get to the pronunciation tip here. It's more of a reminder that we have silent letters in English. At this level, you do know that. Some words contain letters that are written but not spoken. And so those silent letters are B, K, T, and H. They can be silent in some words. Do you know how to say these four words here? I'm going to say them for you. Plumber, not plumber. The B is silent. Knee, not knee. The K is silent. Listen, not listen. Honest, not honest. Honest, the H is quiet. So plumber, knee, listen, and honest. All right, so that's the end of 54. We did review articles and also saying words with silent letters. Uh, if you want more on words that are commonly misspelled, you can simply do an internet search for commonly misspelled uh, American English words and you'll get some of those misspellings. But we have AI, we have uh, check, uh, spelling check, part of Word, Grammarly, so there's really no excuse why you should be misspelling words with all the tools that we have now. All right, next time we're going to dig deep in abstract ideas, Unit 55. See you next time. Uh, please give me a thumbs up. You can leave a comment. It certainly helps. And always check the description of the videos if there are any resources that I come across, anything that I create, anything I want to share with you, or if there's a video that I'd like to suggest, I'll put the link in the description of the video. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.